Thank you very much, and good morning to everybody. Good morning, good morning. John. I really appreciate being invited to come visit y'all, and uh, hopefully what I've got to say will help you. Um, I am the president of NIGP, um, your organization. So if you have questions about NIGP, um, feel free to ask me, even if it's off, off this subject. Um, public procurement is um, obviously my passion. Um, and obviously, if you're doing it, then you must have some passion about it because it's not something you stay in if you don't enjoy it. Most people that um, get into public procurement get in um, kind of by accident because that, there was nothing else to do or that's, they needed somebody that could do it. And once you get involved in it and start dealing with it, you start seeing all the different things that are impacted by public procurement. Um, I know at the university, I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the world because every research project, every new program that's coming up in the university ends up coming through our office for something. Either they need software, they need equipment, they need people. Something comes through our office that tells, uh, tells me what kind of research we're doing. I have the opportunity to um, try to see how to get um, tea, tea leaves or tea seeds from China. You'd think it'd be pretty easy, but you've got to talk about imports, exports, um, converting funds, just fascinating stuff, at least to me. But I'm, I'm a purchasing geek. I'm sorry. I <laughs> um, before I get started on the specification thing, I do want to mention something that I believe in. And I'm still, I'm kind of, I'm throwing this out as I go around the country, talking to different chapters, and I'm waiting for somebody to, to, to question me on it, to tell me I'm wrong, or maybe point out some of the fallacies of my theory. But my theory is that public procurement can save the world. Okay. Now, that's kind of broad, but if you think about it, every city in the United States, every county in Canada, the cities and counties, across the globe, there's government dollars being spent. Even in your third world countries, government dollars are being spent every day. Now, if you take a million dollars into a third world country, and you um, allow it to be spent the way it's been spent in the past, where a good 75% of it goes to bribes and kickbacks, and 20, the other 25% goes to a construction contract or a purchase where the specifications aren't any good, where nobody's there to follow up to make sure that it gets done, the end users, the citizens of that country, get about 10% of the value that they could get. But if you take what you do every day, good public purchasing practices, good specifications, good ethics, good competition, openness, and you take it into that third world country, now you're going to spend 95% of that money giving back to the country. So you're going to have better roads. What, ha what happens with better roads? Better commerce. You're going to have more books in the classrooms. You're going to have more computers in the classrooms. You're going to have classrooms. You're going to have more medicine for the people that are sick. So we're going to take that third world country, and rather than having $100,000 to spend to improve things, you're going to spend $900,000 to improve things. <coughs> and that third world country is going to take one step up. And then the next time, another step up. And pretty soon, they're not going to be a third world country. They're going to be contributing to the society. And that's how you public procurement can save the world. It, mm -hmm. But it's going to take each and every one of us, every day, doing what we do in our own town, in city, county, making sure we're get, getting the most value for every dollar. But at some point, we've got to raise our hands and say, people, look what we're doing. Purchasing is really good about doing the job, getting it done, and staying in here, and not going out in the, in the world of the world and letting people know what we're doing. We've got to get out and tell people what value we're bringing. We've got to make sure our city councils, our board of aldermen, our legislators, our mayors, our governors, all understand that public procurement is the way that they can move their organization and their city, their entity forward. Okay, I'll get out my soapbox now <laughs> and get to the discussion. Specifications. Um, we all deal with them all the time. What I'm going to tell you today is um, my thoughts, my um, ideas, looking back over the 30-some years that I've been doing this, and some of the stuff I learned. Um, and I urge you to challenge me, to ask me, you know, you know, where do, where does that come from? Or to accept it and say, okay, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But either way, we'll move on. 
So why are you here? I'm going to give you a very little bit of history about specifications, and it's history that, like everything else, it can be revised by anybody that wants to. I never really realized history was something that could be revised, but it is. Um, the importance, um, I'm going to talk about basic content of specification, types of specifications, some writing in, um, gifts or ideas. So when was the first specification? Who knows? Probably nobody can d define it. And that's why, I, because I'm the one speaking, I get to tell you when I think the first one was. <laughs> in Genesis um, 6, 14 through 16, it says, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Huh. Oh, make okay. something out of, what kind of wood? Cypress, cypress. wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. If it doesn't have pitch on inside and out, it doesn't meet specs. Um, this is how you're to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Um, make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 15, 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. A specification written a few years back. <laughs> but... Without that specification, without those instructions, what would have been built? Amazing I need a boat. <laughs> well, a little rowboat wouldn't have done the trick getting those two elephants on board, would it? No. Okay. So the Lord told told him how to build it and what to build it out of, and he did it, and we know where that took us. Amen. Okay. Probably some of you may have heard, some okay. of you may have heard this one before. Um, what is the U standard railroad gauge? I mean, what's the distance between the, the tracks? Anybody know? No. Okay. Um, the distance between the rails is four feet eight and a half inches. Okay. Well, that's obviously everybody would make it four feet eight and a half inches. Well, why? Um, that was the width in England. If it was the width in England, might as well do it over here. But why was it that way in England? Same as the pre-railroad tramways, okay? So before they had railroads, they had tramways, but, and they had the same width, but why? Same jigs were used for building wagons, okay? So when they built wagons, they, the wheels were that far apart, mm. but why? <laughs> um, the spacing of the wheel ruts. So there were ruts in the, already in the roads, so you had to have your wheels go down those ruts, otherwise you could be bouncing all over the place. Mm. But why? <laughs> Who made the ruts? <coughs> did we get out there and dig, dig ditches? No. Very good. <laughs> the Roman war chariots all made the same specifications. Okay, same distance, the Roman war chariots, but, but why were they made that way? Well, four feet eight and a half inches was the Roman spec, but why? Chariots were designed, designed to be just enough wide enough to accommodate the back end of two war horses. Ah. Okay, so two war horses, a pull and chariot, that's the width. <laughs> so the next time you're handed some oddball spec and you assume that some government horse's backside <laughs> was responsible for coming up with it, it may be right. It may be because of that. <laughs> that's that some, some fun stuff. That was good. Okay, how do specifications affect the procurement process? It affects the number of bidders. Um, if you've got really overly broad or overly restrictive specifications, your bidders look at it and say, either I can't do it or I don't have a clue what they're looking for. If your specifications say, if you're, you're um, in a junior high school and you need cafeteria tables, right? And all your, ta all your specifications say is tables, they don't know what you're looking for. You could get a little table that is good for kindergartners, or you may get something that's made out of um, concrete. Um, if the specifications are too restrictive, what happens? They say, hey, they've already made their choice. Um, but if they're complete, clear, concise specifications, then you get many more bidders. If you have more bidders, what happens? You get more competition. You have more competition, you get better product and better um, prices. It affects the evaluation process. Um, poorly written specs um, are misinterpreted very easily. Have any of you ever had the opportunity to try to evaluate a, a award 
when the specifications are unclear. And you've got two different vendors saying, I make specifications, he doesn't. And he had anybody gone through that before? <laughs> it's very frustrating. Good specifications don't allow that. Um, if you've got poor specs, there's going to be some misinterpretation. It's hard to figure out who's the low bidder. Uh, the well-written specs, um, sharp, specific criteria. They tell you exactly what you're looking for. Um, they're easier to evaluate, so you can determine which which vendor meets your specs and which one does not. And of course, that if, you, if, if it is clear, understandable, everybody understands what you're looking for, the chance of protest goes down tremendously. Mm -hmm. The bitter risk. Um, poor specs increase the risk to the vendor because they don't know what, what it is they're trying to meet. They're, they don't know what they're trying to do. So if there's higher risk, what's going to be the, their reaction as far as price it goes? It's going to go up. Mm -hmm. they, have to, they have to pad the bid enough so that they can accommodate whatever's going to happen. Um, they don't know what's going to happen, so they're going to bid a price that covers them in case the worst possible scenario happens. So well-written specs are going to make it so that um, they understand what they're doing so they can give you the best price. Um, that goes in case, like, if you're looking for a, a price of something and you want it for a, a year time, but you don't know how much you're going to buy, that's a lot of risk on their part because they don't know when you're going to buy it, if you're going to buy it at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, if you're going to buy a few or a lot. So what that, what that does is makes them say, okay, well, I need to make sure that whatever price I give them today accounts for in the possibility of inflation, the possibility of other issues that might happen. Uh, a dock strike on the West Coast could impact our, our pricing. So they jack their price up. So you have to make sure that when you're, when you're doing your specification, you share the risk, if, if at all possible. How much risk are you willing to accept? How much do you want the vendor to accept? Um, and that, that way, you can manage your pricing a lot better. Um, the more information you can give in a specification, the more detail, the more information they have, the better price they can give you, the better service they can usually give you. Um, the type of contract impacts the specification, this, um, the, the quality of the specification. Um, poorly written specs, the vendor is uncertain as to how much effort they lead to cost the reimbursement contract. In other words, if they don't understand clearly what you're, you're trying to do, it's going to impact your pricing. Um, Well-defined effort leads to a firm fixed price contract, usually. If you want a firm fixed price contract, you may not want one. But if you don't want a firm fixed price contract, you need to determine how it's going to change. Um, I'm working on a contract right now for security cameras. Well, the university doesn't have the money right now to put security cameras in all the buildings. What I want to do, what I'm considering doing, is entering into a five-year five contract with two optional renewals. Well, 15-year contract, there's no way they can give me the pricing, right? So what my idea is, is that they'll give me um, a discount from manufacturer's catalog, and that we will allow, well, the prices, as their catalog changes, our price will change because they have nationally um, published catalogs. It's not like they're going to jack our price and leave everybody else low. So that we'll continue to get that discount for the full 15 years. The part, the part what I, having I was having a little bit of trouble with is that it also includes um, uh, installation and maintenance labor. So what I'm thinking about doing there is asking for labor rates today, what their labor rates are for their two or three different types of workers, and then allow the labor rates to be adjusted on an annual basis um, is basically in, in amount not to exceed the change in the consumer price index. Um, there's a consumer price in index for services not including medical for the South, and that's uh, probably the one that's most likely for us. But again, if I give them all those that information, then they can give me a good bid right now that will keep us in business for 15 years and we can have one security system with all the cameras feeding into our police station. What we have right now is we've got security systems in a bunch of old buildings that were put in at the time. You know, everything from a bell that rings if, a if there's a fire to, 
you know, true cameras and everything like that. We're trying to bring it all together, and as you try to bring stuff together, you have to have standards. So we're, trying, we're going to basically be creating a standard at this time that will last us for at least 15 years. So anyway, that's the kind of thing that you've got, you're, you're working with, is trying to develop something so that the vendor can give you the best possible bid they can while you protect yourself. The administration of contract can be definitely affected by the specification. Um, if your specifications aren't clear, then the, and the vendor provide, delivers something, whatever, whatever it is. How do you know if they've delivered what you're supposed to get? How do you know if you should pay for it? Um, getting back to that junior high school cafeteria table. You want a junior high a cafeteria table that's going to withstand eighth grade boys bouncing up and down on it, because that's what eighth grade boys do. So you've got to have specifications that are, you know, it's got to be made of X material. It's got to be X thick. Um, obviously, you want a certain length and width. You've got to give them the information so that they know what to deliver, but also so that when your people get that delivery, they can look at it and say, yes, this meets our specifications, or no, this does not, and reject it. Um, one of the biggest problems we have in public procurement is contract administration. Um, we do a great job of going th through a, a, a developing specifications, go getting all the bidders to bid, advertising everywhere, getting good bids in, awarding a contract or issuing a purchase order, and then it goes out, the purchase order goes out the door, and we go like this. And nobody tell, does anything. Something comes in, somebody says, oh, yeah, it's over there, signs for it, we pay it. Um, pest control is a great example. How many times do we have a pest control guy come in and spray around, and our, our accountant gets the, accounts payable gets the invoice and says, yeah, I, I saw him spraying something. And pays for it, right? How do we know it's doing any good? Who's out there checking to make sure there's no pests? Nobody. We don't do a good job of contract administration. What we started doing, and I'm not, I'd be interested to hear how other people are handling it, but any contract that has over is over for over twenty-five thousand dollars, which is a fairly small amount of money at the university, we require them to assign a contract administrator. And when the contract comes to my office, the contract administrator has to have signed off on the, the cover sheet saying, yes, I know I'm responsible for administering this contract, making sure we got what we're supposed to get, that we don't pay more than we're supposed to, that, that if we're having a consultant come in and write us a report, something actually gets done with that report, things like that. Um, assigning the responsibility of administration, because we have an the responsibility of Develop, developing and submitting a requisition, we know that. Signing the purchase order, issuing a purchase order, we know who's responsible for that. But typically, the administration of a contract, no one's responsible. And if no one's responsible, guess what? It doesn't get done. Bill. Don, uh, one of the things that, that we had done was, uh, you're right, it, usually it's go forth and be fruitful with, when the contract's awarded. But I had a meeting with the department, the vendor, and myself. And we went over the contract, what the deliveries were, what the specifications were. So everybody understood what the, the contract said because usually the department never read it. So they were unaware of what was uh, expected. So when something came in, of course, purchasing got blamed because it wasn't what they expected. So, did you do that on all contracts, or just no, over a certain threshold? It was, or? It was uh, the the higher dollar yeah. ones. Uh, yeah, the smaller ones. Uh, I put my faith in the department to be able to handle that. But it, yeah, that's a great idea. How, anybody else have ways their hand in contract administration? Am mm -hmm. I yeah? Yeah, we uh, on all our on all our term contracts in the contract, there's an administrative agent assigned. Uh -huh. Any anytime there's an amendment invoice, the administrative agent actually has to sign off on any of that. It has to be part of the process. Uh, that's for all the term contracts, any of the construction contracts, same type of thing. We have a, someone assigned to verify that the work that the work's getting done. So it's it's in the contract. Now, is it getting done? Is the individuals actually? Staying on top of that, we do find out sometimes that that's not the case, and what that does come up to is then, okay, 
how can we, we have meetings with the departments? Okay, you're putting these specifications out. Have you actually been up making sure that the current vendor has been meeting those specifications? Uh, then how can you hold the next vendor to those specifications? So that conversation ends up happening. Are we going to broaden these up, or are you going to start making sure you're doing the correct job? So that does those conversations do happen. That's a that's a great point about the fact that you know if you have a contract with someone and they aren't giving you what you're supposed to be getting, you're not only being unfair to yourself and your citizens, but really unfair to those other vendors that, that submit proposals or bids because they they offered a price. For what you were supposed to get, stuff, yeah. and you're accepting something less than what you're supposed to get. So yeah, that's a great point. Um, appreciate the comments. But anyway, the, you know, the good specification you can administer it better. Um, it just it, a good specification makes life easier all the way around. So how to write specifications? You know, what do you do? Okay, you need a gas chromatograph. First of all, you have to figure out what a gas chromatograph is. But, um, so how do, how do you go about it? This is just a Reader's Digest version of what I've always done. You know, consult the users. Get back with the end users, the, the people that are requesting it, finding out what is it that they're wanting to be done. When, why, how. Um, huge, something that came up a couple of months ago, actually about a year ago now, um, we got a request in from a department for, I think it was, 28,000 pamphlets, okay? And we put it out for bid, and um, I think it was going to be um, right around 20, we got the bids in, it was right around $27,000, okay? Um, got ready to order it, um, asked the department if that was acceptable to them. They said, oh, well, Don, if it's only going to cost that much, we want to get more. We want to spend $30,000. I said, well, we didn't go out for bid for that many. We went out for bid for 28000 because that's what you had asked for. And they said, yeah, but we've got $30,000 of grant money that we've got to spend. We can only spend it on this. We want to increase the amount we want to buy. And I said, well, we can't do that because we told the vendors up front how many we were going to buy. You know, to change it mm -hmm. from, you know, 28,000 pamphlets to, you know, 31,000 pamphlets <coughs> would be unfair. Um, it wouldn't be in compliance with the law. And so I said, what you should have done, and maybe my fault for not coming to you earlier on, but what you could have done is told me, Don, we've got $30,000 to spend on pamphlets. Let's put this out for bid. Then what I would have done is I would have told the vendors, these are the pamphlets we want. We're going to spend $30,000. Whoever gives us the most pamphlets for $30,000 will get the award. So changing it from a, a dollar, you know, low dollar to high quantity. But because we didn't have that consultation before, because we didn't talk early, you know, at the beginning, we found ourselves making a mistake. So the first thing is consult the users. Find out what it is they're trying to accomplish. Find out what, how they've been doing this in the past. Find out as much as you can about what it is they're, they're wanting. Get with the vendors. Find out, you know, I usually ask the departments, you know, okay, give me two or three products that you think would be acceptable to you. Just give me, give me a name, whatever. Then you can look out and look at product literature and see what are the similarities mm -hmm. between those. I also like to ask the end users, give me a product that you would not want to um, get the award. Mm -hmm. Because then I can compare that <coughs> to the ones that, um, that they want and figure out what's the difference. You know, okay, okay, the ones that they want are all, you know, uh, 400 pounds and have a one horsepower uh, uh, motor. The one they don't want is 100 pounds and has a quarter horsepower motor. Okay, obviously, it's a cheaper product. So, when I'm developing the specifications, I inc in include some kind of, well, it must be, you know, greater than 380 pounds or greater than 350, whatever, or, um, and must have a, a motor at least one horsepower, one horsepower or more. Boom, now I've written specifications that meet what they're looking for and restrict the ones that they aren't looking, they don't want. Um, I contact other entities. Um, how many of you are members of NIGP? Excellent. You've got, how many of you use the NIGP um, spec library? Good. I urge you to use the spec library. That helps helpful. But also use Insight. 
the, um, the um, co online community where you can go in and purchase issues or whichever one you're a member of and say, hey, I'm getting ready to go out for bid for um, security cameras. Does anybody have a good RFP that I could, um, you know, borrow, steal, <laughs> plagiarize, whatever you want to call it? That's one great thing about public procurement. We share, and if, if you're out in the, in the private sector, you may not be able to share with your competitors, but we all um, can share our specifications. So I check with the different entities, ask them, you know, if they have a spec that I should use. Also, a lot of times I'll go to the suppliers and I'll ask them, especially if it's a national type company, I'll ask them, give me, give me some specifications from other governmental entities that have been successful in the past that you thought were fair and equitable. Now, do I just take what one tells me and accept it? No, no. I bounce it off others to make sure that it is fair and equitable and it's not giving anyone a, a huge advantage. I collect the information from all the different sources. Um, I review the documentation. And I develop a draft specification based on what I've got. Um, sometimes the end user helps me develop the specification. Sometimes they develop it, and then I have to go back and review it. Um, but then once I've got a draft, a lot of times I'll send it back, I'll send it out to three or four vendors, suppl potential suppliers. I'll send it back to the end user, of course. I'll say, okay, will this get what you need? And I tell, ask the suppliers, will this get us what we need? Are there suggestions, improvements? What are the problems with these specifications that you see? And I get their input back in. And then I take that and I, I weigh it against openness, fairness, credibility. Obviously, if one of them tells me, well, it, it needs to um, require that the um, frame be painted yellow with green stripes, I kind of kind of question that, you know? I mean, maybe that's what their brand is. But it, it, a lot, most of the times, suppliers are in the business to try to help us. They're trying to give us solutions. They're trying to help us get what we need to have. And usually they'll give me good information. Um, they understand that we want to be fair and equitable. Um, one of the things that, as I talk more and more with the suppliers, the, the really the good ones, <coughs> they're looking at ways, trying to figure out ways that we can write into our specifications, into our RFPs, more value. How do we maximize the value so that we can look at it not just as what's the cheapest thing to buy today, but what's the thing that's going to work best, best for us in the long run? Um, we did a lighting retro, we're actually in the middle of a lighting retrofit on campus right now, where historically what we would have done is we would have hired an engineer to come in and tell us what um, fixtures to put in, so which lamps to put in. We'd go out for bid for a construction contract to replace all the fixtures. What we did instead is we went out and we did an RFP and we gave the um, potential suppliers eight buildings. We said, we want you to come in and look at these eight buildings, tell us what we've got in place now, how much energy we're using, what you would recommend we do, um, and then tell us how much it's going to cost us to install, maintain, and inter provide energy for it for 20 years. A 20-year life cycle. So what they were able to do is come in, look at the buildings, and we got, about, I think, five different proposals. Each of them gave us different ideas of what we, we asked for a good, better, and best. They each gave us different ideas of what they would propose that we do. But we were able to evaluate it based on what their past experience was, their ability to prove savings, not just what they say they're going to save, but where, where have they been where they've actually sh um, provided savings from energy savings. Um, we did the evaluation. We awarded a cup to a company. And now they're going, they're, they did those first eight buildings, but they're, they have a contract for the entire campus. Because what we said is whoever gets the award for the first eight buildings will continue to service the rest, do the rest of the buildings using the same cost structure that they use for those first days. Um, we were able to go from T12 or whatever the last of fluorescent bulbs were to LED in about 90% of our buildings. Um, and we're gonna, it's gonna pay for itself in I think 4.8 years. And after that point, we're gonna be saving millions of dollars over the next 20 years because of the energy savings. So again, the, the getting feedback, working with departments, giving, 
giving the vendors the opportunity to give you something, not just the product, but the solution that you're really looking for. Um, by getting their feedback, they can give you ideas of what can we do, not just for today, but for the future, so we can uh, maximize our, our value. Um, you get the feedback in, you revise it, and then you can put it out for bid, um, or an RFP. But I, 30 years ago when I started in, in public procurement, the concept of working with the, the, the suppliers and with the vendors um, was more, I would say, that well, they're over there and we're over here, and you can't really come together. Um, actually, the, the early 80s was the time when some of the, some people in our profession were beginning to realize the value that the, the um, suppliers could bring to us, but it's still at that time there was a vast majority of people that felt, no, you, you can't talk to them. A am I right, Bill? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And over the, the past, like, 30 years, it's, it's really changed. Now, what's sad is we do have some situations that happen. Um, what happened in Mississippi recently, I'll get, tell you about it. Our um, commissioner of our Department of Corrections was, um, they were contracting for various services to run prisons around the state and various other things. And um, he had an influence on how those were awarded. Mm -hmm. um, they got awarded, and then he went to those companies, that company, and said, you need to hire this guy over here as a consultant, because he really understands Mississippi, um, you know, how we do business in Mississippi. So they mm -hmm. hired this person over here for like $20,000 a year, and he, quote, consulted for them, and he got paid $20,000, and the commissioner got $10,000 oh, wow. And apparently this has been going on for quite a while, over a number of contracts, millions of dollars um, inappropriately um, given to the commissioner. Uh, he had a 350, he, he was making 112,000 a year, okay? He had a $350,000 house paid off. He had a condo on the beach paid off. He had two Mercedes Benz paid off, and he was wearing a Rolex. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, he got arrested, um, and the immediate reaction wasn't that this guy has no ethics. The immediate reaction is our purchasing laws are flawed. We've got to get rid of no-bid contracts. It, it, it had nothing to do with <laughs> sole source contracts, but that's what the reaction was. So what the reaction in Mississippi right now is um, very strict, very, you know, Got to get 14 different signatures to you know, buy a piece of bubble gum. It, it, it's really frustrating because we've come, come so far in trying to make things better um, through the RFP process, through working with vendors, through looking for um, solutions as opposed to just the cheapest product. And I'm afraid this is going to push us backwards. Um, but the solutions are the key. It's finding, you know, we don't buy. Like I said, 30 years ago, office supplies, toilet tissue, and paper towels were the biggest, most important things to get on state contract. Well, that's that's old stuff. We've been doing that for hundreds of years. We're buying electronically. What we're doing today is the neat stuff, you know, um, getting bridges built and um, buying new computer systems um, so that we can provide better services to the people. Um, quality level. It's not about what you want, but what you need. Um, I, I try to explain that to our departments a lot of times. And, you know, when they're writing specifications, a lot of times they want they want this quality level, but we've got to get back to the level of, okay, what is it you need? You may need this quality level, but we've got to be able to define it, which gets back to you can get better quality if you have good specifications and you can define how you arrived at the quality level that you need. Um, temp services. Okay, everybody knows buying temp services is, right? So I'm just going to go out and bid for temp services, okay? When I, what, what am I looking for? If I'm, if I'm looking for temp services, anybody? Temp. Labor. Yeah. Labor, okay. For short periods of time, maybe? Yeah, um, Anybody would have guessed 
You're looking for somebody to take your temperature? No. <laughs> <laughs> Again, using, a wor using words, if you don't define it clearly, you don't know what you're asking for or what you're going to get. Um, understanding your client's needs. What's their business need? Obviously, a clear description of their needs is important. Um, but what's the strategic value to the organization? If, there's, if the organization isn't going to receive value out of this purchase, are you really need, do you really need to make it? What's the strategic value? Um, does it enhance customer service? Does it allow you to, your people to do a better job? Um, does, it, does it improve a process? Does it save money? Um, does it help employees get better development? What's the purpose of the purchase? Whether it's a small item, whether it's a big item, whether it's a service contract, what's the purpose? What's the business need? Because if you can't define that, and somebody comes back and says, why did you spend that money? You're in trouble. So the description of the product or service, um, try to be as non-technical as possible. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff we have to be very technical with. But <clears throat> you need to have a, the description, at least, non-technical enough so that someone can understand what it is you're doing without having to have a PhD. Um, has to be easy to understand, um, and it's basically what you put in the advertisement. The idea behind the advertisement is twofold, in my opinion. One is to let potential bidders understand what it is you're looking for, but it's also out there to let the public, the general public, know what you're spending money on. And if that description of your need says Model 34Z27A, there's only one person out there, one company out there that knows what you're talking about. That's not a good description. Give a general description of what you're looking for, understanding that hopefully we don't have any idiots, idiots out there that are going to bid based on what's in the newspaper or what's, out, what's posted on your website. They're actually going to go and look at the specifications. Um, understand the constraints. Um, any restrictions that affect the ability to obtain the goods or services. Are there restrictions? Are there federal guidelines? Are there um, legal issues that have to be involved? Um, the timing of it? When is it needed? How many times do we have a situation where we get something in and somebody says, well, we needed it last week. Well, did you tell us that when you were making the request? Now, true, if you ask them when they want it, their answer is yesterday. Um, but you, you've got to make that determination at the beginning of the process. When is it needed? Do we need to have a rush on this? Do we need to include that in the specifications? If so, what's going to happen to our cost? It's going to go up. Um, is there a bu are there budget constraints? Based on our estimate, you know, our budget's 40000 Based on our estimates, this is going to cost us 80000 Why go through the process? Um, we had one the other day, it just blew my mind, um, it was the other way around really, where um, the department gave it to us and said, um, we need this put out for bid, I said, okay, and they said, uh, they said, you know, I think it'll be under 50,000, our bid threshold is 50,000, I think it'll be under 50,000, I'm not sure, so, he said, okay, we'll put it out for bid, that way if it goes over 50, we've gone through the right process, got the bids in, they were 12,000 and 8,000. Oh, and we're sitting there going, we went through that entire process for this. We could have just gotten two quotes. But, you know, sometimes, again, did we do our job up front? Well, we asked them. Maybe we could have done some more um, due diligence to maybe do a, a search to find out what the cost actually would be. But when you've got this much work to do and you're looking at the department <coughs> telling you X, you follow it. Um, does, are your staff skills up to, up to speed? Are you buying something that's going to require more training? Are your people capable of handling the, this new product or service? Um, what's the availability of it? <coughs> is it something that's widespread that everybody can offer? Or is it very unique? Um, and you, you'd be lucky if you get two bids, be lucky if you get one. Um, the price stability, again, is this something I'm going to go out for bid for for one-time purchase, or if it's a long-term contract? Is the price stable? Can we can we count on it? Is it 
Um, is it tied to petroleum? Um, right now, that's not so, that's your nation, but there's been times in the past where anything that was petroleum based, you couldn't get a price, you know, <laughs> tomorrow, let alone, you know, for a month, month's time. What about weather conditions? Does that impact either our need for something or their ability to deliver it? Um, obviously, you know, road salt, people up in the north need to buy road salt ahead of time, have it on, have it there when it happens. You can't be sitting there with, when, the, when the snow starts falling and saying, oh, we need to buy some road salt. Um, you have to plan ahead. Um, also, like I said earlier, the situation on the West Coast right now where they've got a bunch of the docks, um, the dock workers are on strike and not letting as much come in off the ships. How does that impact us? It may not impact you in Florida quite as much as people on the western half of the country, but the, those people on the western half of the country, a lot of their goods that come in from Japan, China, wherever else, are coming into the ports in Seattle to call the San Francisco, Los Angeles, and if they can't get off the ship, your people are sitting there going, we can't get it. Knowing that there's that possibility, it's our job in procurement to tell our people, look, these things that you have been buying from overseas, we need to order them three or four months further in advance. Um, <laughs> timing is always interesting. I got a, when I was at the state purchasing office one time, I got a request for an emergency purchase. It was January 4th. You know, one of our universities sent the request to me. We have an emergency purchase. You know what they were buying? Calendars. No. <laughs> they, they had forgotten to order calendars in advance. I mean, the fact that January was going to come right after December just blew them away. <laughs> but all these things, understanding your clients' needs, understanding and looking at all the different things that can impact that. The economy. Um, I, I urge people all the time, read about the economy. Um, Kipling in her letter, how many of you ever heard of that? Okay, how many of you read it regularly? Excellent. We, we, we get it, so I read it every week. I think it comes out every two weeks. I try to read it because it tells me what's going on across the, the world that's impacting the economy. If I know what's impacting the economy, I know how that might impact us. Thus, I can be the expert to give our people more information. That's, that's all this is, is us being the go-to source for information. If you have the information, then you can, you can tell people about it, and they look at you and say, wow, that's impressive. And then the next time they need help, where do they come? They don't go to the lawyer anymore. They come to purchase them. Assumptions. Is there limited competition? <coughs> Huge issue. You, you, I mean, if, if, if you know there's going to be very little competition, then you've got to be very careful to make sure your specifications are, A, open enough to get the, the few that will compete, but you also have to make sure that you go out and contact them and say, hey, did you get this? I mean. If it's a small order, I, okay, I understand that. But if you've got a you know, hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollar purchase, and you advertise it and you send it out, to, you know, to the right people, how do you know that they're going to submit a bid? You don't. Sometimes you need to go take the extra step and say, hey, just want to make sure you got this, and you know it's due at two o'clock on <laughs> Wednesday. Um, is there going to be a high level of public interest? Is this something that's, that's going to be on the front page of the paper? <laughs> it shouldn't change the way we do things, but I urge you to let it change the way you look at it. I urge you to be very, you know, rather than checking your list twice, check it four times. Um, have, somebody, have somebody else in your office, a couple of people, review the specifications, review the process to make sure that there's nothing that could be construed as being unfair or showing favoritism. Um, is it a change in the process? This is a huge issue. Um, if you've been doing something using an invitation to bid, where you've been awarding to the low bid that meets specifications, and now you decide you're going to do an RFP so you can take into consideration past performance and the plan for how they're going to conduct business and the life cycle cost. You put that out there, those vendors that have been doing it the way you've always done it, either A, aren't going to understand it, or B, they're going to bid the way they always have. If you're changing a process, it's very important, in my opinion, to maybe have a pre-bid conference so that they understand 
what the change is. Um, <clears throat> who are the major stockholders? Um, who are the people that have influence? Okay, city, it's your city council, your mayor. Are they going to have any heartburn about what you're doing? Are they going to understand what you're doing? Um, when this hits the streets, are the potential suppliers <coughs> going to contact your mayor or your city council or your attorney or the department? Understand who's going to have the influence. Who, who are the contact points? Make sure they understand up front what's going out and make sure they understand up front that any questions should come to you. Now, I wish every one of us had a situation where you can go to the mayor or like I can go to the president of the university and tell him, I say, please, any questions? I understand that they're going to want your, your input, but if you will, forward them to me so we can deal with them. Because I want to keep you out of the political spotlight and out of p potential political issues. I'm in a position where I, I can do that. He's very good about it most of the time. There's once in a while one of these huge do big donors will get to him, and then I get a, letter, a, a question from him. And usually my response is, please have them contact me. But understand who the people are that could be contacted, and make sure you're in contact with them before other people are. Um, are there organizations with influence um, that, that might be impacted by your solicitation? Who are the impacted parties? Understanding those types of issues will help you um, go through the battle better in the long run. Um, all of this gets back to what I was talking about early on. Know from the beginning what you're trying to accomplish. Bill? We had a, a situation mm -hmm. where uh, one of my county commissioners came to me when we were writing an RFP. And he had heard about this and wanted to see what the specification said. So I sent him up a copy of the specification. I told him it was still a work in progress. He said, fine. Finished it up, uh, sent it back to the department. They reviewed it. We made some changes. It went out. It came back, and it was, he had given it to somebody. So they responded with a copy that was pre-revision. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> no uh, mm -hmm. the vendor was very upset. The county commissioner was very, very upset that we had tried to screw the, the vendor by confusing him. So when, whenever we sent uh, drafts to commissioners, et cetera, or elected officials that were curious, we always made sure that we had a stencil of copy on everything so that they knew that it was a copy. And not to share it with anyone. I well, I usually um, when I'm work when I'm working on a spec, when I first start out, I use word mark, whatever. Watermark. 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 Draft. Draft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crossed it. Yeah. And then that way, that they hopefully understand that that's not a final version. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's huge. Good point. Mm -hmm. And it does point out rather quickly who's got a uh, an in interest in the uh, in the process. Yeah. You know, I was, I'm, one thing that I try to get across to our departments about the whole working with us, it, in historically, I've got to admit, every, I think every place is probably like this, the using department comes to procurement um, when they're ready to buy something, you know, not when they're thinking about it. And what I try to get to convince them of is come to us when you start thinking about going there. I said, look at us as a, like a GPS. If you're going to go from um, Sarasota, Florida, to Seattle, Washington, okay, I know I'm going to go north, and then I'm going to go west, and I'm going to go north, and sooner or later I'll get there. But which roads would I take? Well, I don't exactly know. But if I put it into a GPS that I want to go to Seattle, Washington, I want to avoid toll roads, it will tell me how to get there. But purchasing is the same way. If they'll come to us at the beginning and say, this is where we are, this is where we want to be, we can tell them how to get there the best way. But if they wait until the end, 
mean, they're someplace in um, Tijuana, Mexico, and are lost, and come to say, how do I get there from here? It, we have to say, well, <laughs> first of all, you need to go back on the other side of the border. And, you know, and then we can, we can guide them. Usually what happens is they come to us at the end, and we have to say, well, look, we still have to go through a big process. And they say, well, if we'd known that, that's why come to us early. So come to us early, figure out who those stockholders are, know who the players are. Um, a good specification, good scope of work, should identify the minimum requirements, obviously. What's the minimum we're looking for? Um, it a lot should allow for competition. Um, we've got it. The whole idea of government procurement is that we have competition for a couple of reasons. One, be fair and equitable to potential providers, but also competition gets us better products and better services and better prices. If possible, having reproducible test methods. How are we going to evaluate if this product meets our requirements or not? Um, if, if it's a brand name, if it's, uh, you know, obviously if, if you're buying materials and you need it to be able to be tested, like concrete has to be tested, you know, there's test um, requirements um, you can put in. <coughs> Provide for an equitable award. Um, how are you gonna know about looking at the bids, which one's best? Obviously, in an uh, RFP situation, it's not quite as easy, not quite as clear cut, because you have to look at um, the different criteria and evaluate them and score them. But in a specification where there's an invitation to bid, realistically, in my opinion, everybody sitting at that bid opening should be able to determine who meets, who, who should be awarded that contract. The specification should be clear enough that everyone can t determine, yes, product A meets the specifications, and product A is low. Or using whatever formula you put into your specifications, whether it's energy efficiency or miles per gallon or whatever, that if you use that formula, plug in the prices from the bid, everybody leaving that table should understand and know. The worst possible situation is where you open bids and you have two vendors walking out saying, yeah, I got it. <laughs> because you know that you're in trouble right there. <laughs> so, if it, it, it can provide for an equitable war that everyone can see easily, yep, I lost that one, so I, I move on, you're going to be in a much better position. And a lot of times what I will do is, especially when I'm just starting out with a new type of contract, new formula, whatever, I'll give it to two of my staff members and say, okay, bid on this. And then let's open the bids, and you guys tell me who, who you think should be the award of the contract. If my staff members can understand the process, then it's more likely that the vendors will understand the process. Okay? If the vendors understand the process, there's less likely for complaints and for getting the ultimate the mayor involved. <laughs> okay, Sim a good specification, Sim simple, consistent, and exact as possible. I mean, it, it, it's not as simple as that. It, it just, oh, well, I'll, obviously, I'll be exact. Well, you've got to give. A range. You can't say this table has to be, you know, 34.755 inches long, because that may be too restrictive. Um, identified with some brand specification. Sometimes it's a lot easier if you if you're writing spe specs for just general item, using brand name specifications where you use two or three brands, or say or equal. It's a lot easier than trying to write specifications for something that's very simple. Um, cap capable of being checked. Can you determine if it meets specifications? Reasonable intolerance. That's what basically that's saying is, you know, plus or minus 5%. Um, you know, when you're buying a, a tractor, okay, if every company has a 100 horsepower tractor, then that's fine. You can put 100 horsepower. But if one of them has a 98 horsepower tractor and everybody else has 100, why not put 98 horsepower? or 100 horsepower plus or minus 5%. Something to open up some tolerance so you're not award, you know, writing your specifications so only one company can bid. Um, fair to the seller, you know. A lot of times people look at us and say, well, th their job is just to beat the seller down and make them sell at the lowest price. That doesn't do us any good. You know, we, we may get a good price one time, but if we put a company out of business because of their, they, they came in so low, then next time they're not going to be able to bid. 
Or if they come in, they bid, they lose money or don't make a fair profit, then next time you go out for bid, what's going to happen? They're not going to want to play. So we've got to be make sure that we're fair to the sellers. Um, capable of being met by the sellers, obviously. If they can't meet the specifications, you're wasting your time and energy. Uh, clear and up to date. Up to date. I saw a specification, I'm not going to say where it was, but uh, it was about two years ago, and they were they, they were saying that it had to be in co compliance with um, was it 2K? Y2K? 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 I'm sitting there going, okay, that's a little bit out of date, people. Uh, people in the room probably don't know what Y2K was. <laughs> so, again, your terms and conditions have to be kept up to date. Your specifications have to be kept up to date. Just because it worked good the last time you put it out for bid five years ago doesn't mean it's still valid. Um, and some a fair degree of flexibility. Um, is there an opportunity for a vendor to come in and offer you something better? I mean, if, if, if they've got a new idea that you haven't thought of before, how does that get into the process? My hope is that you have an open enough conversation with your suppliers up front so that as new ideas come to the market, they're letting you know. But if a vendor gets a set of specifications and they've got a product or service that will provide you much better what you are, your end goal, you know, getting to Seattle. Um, they, they, actually, they're going to put you on a plane and take you rather than you drive it. But if you ask for directions driving, isn't, you're not opening that up, up for conversation. So um, the ability for them to come to you after the bids hit the market and maybe give you some different ideas, and if you have to, pull the bid off the street and start over again. But you've got to be open to new ideas because that's the way I mean, that's the way business is run. They're, we're looking for the best solution to, for tomorrow rather than what we did yesterday. Um, sometimes the requirement should, in, uh, should include a basic design. You know, obviously construction is design specifications. Um, physical dimensions, weights, percentages, and types of ingredients, um, types of materials. Those types of specifications are a little bit easier to write um, usually we have a professional um, architect and engineer writing some of, most of those type. Some documents that you may use um, or get documents from, obviously U.S. government, ASTM, uh, Canadian General Standards Board, um, other cities, counties, federal government, um, NIGP, NASPO, all of these are sources for documents and materials that you may be able to use. And I urge you to take advantage of these types of things rather than rewriting your own. Um, I don't know that I've written the spec without stealing from somebody else in the 34 years. I mean, you get other people's documents, you find the best and worst of each document and combine them to come up with something you like better. Different types of specifications, brand name, um, of course that's where you um, have there's two different types of brand name specifications. Brand name only, where you say it has to be this brand. Basically, that's very restrictive. Um, a lot of sta states, cities, counties have rules prohibiting uh, overly restrictive specifications. But, and this is a, this is really an old example, but it shows how long I was like, teaching this stuff. Um, if you've got a classroom and everybody has an IBM Selectric typewriter. Okay? That's how old it, you know what typewriters are? <laughs> okay, and you, you need to buy more um, typewriters to go in that classroom. Are you going to buy a brother typewriter or some other brand? No, you're going to want to have the IBM Selectric <coughs> Model 123A because that's what everybody has. And you don't want the teacher up there saying, okay, now all of you students that have this, you do it this way, but this student over here, you do it this way. It just doesn't work. So you would write specifications for a brand name only. Or if you standardize on a certain product, you know, over the years, then you want that brand only. So that, that's one type of specification where you just list the brand and model number and say that's all we can accept. If you do that, I would urge you to have a good justification documentation why you're, you're doing that. Um, brand name or equal is where you list one or two brands. 
Um, and then you list some salient features that you're looking for. Um, you need know, a refrigerator freezer to be a Westinghouse Model 123 or Maytag 157. Um, must have ice on the door, water on the door, must have a vegetable bin. <coughs> um, must be 17.3 or 17 cubic feet or more. Must have one horse or three quarter horsepower motor. Okay, now you've listed two brands, some salient features that you're looking for, and the vendors, A, know what you're looking for. They know the quality level because they they're in the industry, they can compare with that quality. Also, when you get your bids in, you can look, you, okay, you get one for the model you're looking, Westinghouse or whatever, but you also get a, um, you know, XYZ brand. You can get their product literature, you can look at it and say, okay, well, it's 17 cubic feet, the compressor is one horsepower or three quarter horsepower, whatever it was. It's a, you're able to tell if they met the specifications or not. So <clears throat> those are the different types of brand name specifications. A qualified products list is where you actually test the products before you um, go out for bid. If you have, we did this for can liners back a long time ago where we said, okay, people, we want to put out a statewide contract for can liners. Um, we're going to test the products before we put out the bid. If you want your product listed on the qualified product <coughs> list, you got to have to submit X number of samples. We got the samples in. We put 40, depending on whether it was a lightweight bag, medium weight, heavyweight, or extra, we put a certain poundage of bark mulch in the bag, lifted it up to two feet off the ground, and if it lasted for a minute, it passed. If it didn't last, last for a minute, it didn't pass, okay? Then what we did is we took those that had passed, notified the vendors, notified all the vendors, yours passed, yours didn't, listed those and said, okay, going out for bid, These, this is our qualified products list, you can bid any, on any of the qualified products, but if, it, if it's not listed, you can't, so that's what our qualified products list is. It takes a lot of time up front, so if the industry is changing rapidly, I would advise against it. Um, toner cartridges, I would never do it like that because toner cartridges, every week, three new ones come out. So the, specific, the, the qualified products list you did last month won't be good next month. If you're gonna do a qualified products list, I would hope that it'd be good for a couple of years. Um, but then as new companies come on, they can submit their products, you test them, you can either add them to the qualified product list or not. Um, design specifications, that's typically like your well, construction is design specification most, most of the time where um, it's telling, you know, it's going to be X, Y, Y, length, width, what it's made of, all that type of thing. Performance specifications are specifications based on what is going to be accomplished. Um, we want um, something that is going, we, we want to hire a company that will keep this, these rooms clean, um, keep the bathrooms clean, all that, um, and you're going to evaluate them not based on the number of times they vacuum the floor, but whether there's stuff on the floor. On the, evaluating based on the performance. And then design performance is a mixture of the two. It's going, you're gonna, um, you know, we want the building cleaned every night. Now that's design, you're telling them how often you want it done. But the performance level um, is, is going to be also there. Um, it, it's kind of like, okay, if you, you've got a, you know what Kudzui, Kudzui is? <laughs> okay, you guys have Kudzu in Florida? North Florida. Okay, well we, we have cut, we have lots of Kudzu in Mississippi. And it's a ground, green ground cover that takes over everything, including light poles, trees, grows everywhere, and mm -hmm. nothing will stop. So, if you've got a hillside along the, high, along the highway and you want to get rid of Kudzu, you could write a, a design specification that says I want a um, you know, 80 horsepower articulating mower that has a 15 foot cutting swath, you know, so that I can cut. Okay. Um, or you could just say, I want something that will keep that vegetation from growing onto the road. Okay. You know, perform that would be a performance specification, and somebody could come in with a piece of equipment to do that. They could come in with um, a herbicide to try to kill it, or they could come in with you know, 10 billy goats, put them <laughs> on the side of the road, they eat the kudzu, they would never get on the road, and they'd pass the performance requirement. <laughs> so 
you have to have an idea of what you're trying to accomplish before you decide what kind of specification would be most appropriate for you. The general format of a specification, um, this can be obviously <laughs> changed depending on what you got, want to do, but first of all, I would suggest that all of your specifications, all of your bid documents be relatively consistent. So that if people get the bid, the bid document on a regular basis, they know where to look for the different things. If each time you put something out, it's in a different format, and for them to figure out what the term of the contract is, they have to hunt for it, it makes it difficult for them. Also, by having templates, it makes it a lot easier for you that you can just plug, plug and play <laughs> as much as possible. But so you start out by having the scope and classification. What is the scope of the work? So that they read the beginning and say, yeah, I can do that, and they continue to read. Or, no, I'm not interested, and they can put it aside. Um, in the applicable publications, if you're referring to ASTM standards or if you're referring to federal guidelines, go ahead and list those. Tell them what they, what, the, what you're um, including as part of the requirements as far as any publications. List your requirements. Um, what, what are the requirement, minimum requirements you're looking for? Um, is there going to be any type of sampling, inspection, testing procedure? How are, when you get the product in, product or service in, how are you going to determine whether it meets your requirements or not? Um, is there any preparation for delivery? Where is it going to be delivered? How is it going to be delivered? Huge issue. If you don't have a loading dock and you're asking them to deliver four pallets of something, they need to know that when you do the solicitation. Um, during the emergencies, during Katrina, I mean, how many of you have been involved in an emergency pro procurement situation? Happened? Okay. One of the biggest things we, found, we ran into was, you know, we ordering ice and all this other stuff. Well, <laughs> we didn't have any place for it to be delivered except in the middle of the Kmart parking lot, okay? So these guys could pull up with truckloads of ice, no loading dock to unload it onto. So how do you get it on and off the truck? Um, we ended up having to have um, our U.S. military on site helping to unload bags of ice. Um, but again, delivery time. Are there, you know, can they deliver in the middle of the night, or must it be delivered between eight and five Monday through Friday? Is there a loading dock? You know, those types of things. Um, and then any notes or comments, any unique situations that you you need to make them aware of. Um, when I, I talk about the other specifications and standards, like I said, ASTM, um, AS, ACME, different types of um, publications that you may have to include either the requirements from that or reference that as your guidance or your standard. Um, delivery and packaging, like I said, are you looking for something just in time? So, you know, it's delivered, you know, ordered today, or delivered to the desk the next day. Um, are there deadlines? It's, you know, obviously if you're ordering, um, you know, fertilizer and you need to have it available when they start planting, you know, you need to have it a certain time. Um, if you need, we ordered uh, mattresses several years ago now, and we were opening a new residence hall, and the resident hall, students were moving in on August 8th. So we had to have the new mattresses by August 1st. They didn't show up until September 1st. Guess what? That causes problems. Make sure that there's deadlines that you're aware of them and that the vendors are aware of them. Um, is there a loading dock, or is it... It's going to be delivered to the 15th floor. You ever ordered a conference room table to be delivered to the 15th floor? And they show up saying, uh -uh, I didn't plan for this. You know, it's not going up the stairway. We're going to have to put it on top of the elevator and ride it up there. You know, plan in advance, understanding what the situation is. And it's so hard in your position because you're, most of us are probably sitting in an office. We get a request from a department who may be on the other side of town. Um, and they're making a request, and you're saying, well, obviously they know what they're doing. <laughs> Duh, who made that mistake? So you get, they get, this, um, get it in, and it can't be delivered to the room it's supposed to be delivered to. Or we ordered a, um, a heating and air conditioning unit and got it ordered really right on time, delivered. The building wasn't going to be finished for six more months. 
we have the unit just sitting, waiting for the building to be delivered. <coughs> um, is it supposed to be drop shipped? Or is, are we asking them to set it up? You know, when you buy furniture, okay, chairs, desks, okay, just drop ship it. Who's going to set it up? Who's going to put those wheels on the chairs? Um, you know, not, not my departments. <laughs> um, is it ordering it loose or packaged? You know, buying, um, this is an old, another old example, but, you know, 500 file folders. Do you want them packaged 10 per package so you can hand them out? Or do you just order 500 and put them someplace and they start disappearing? You know. Um, so again, this kind of information, whether it's something as simple as file folders or something as complex as a new computer system, these are the kind of things you need to know. If you're ordering a new computer system, what kind of training is going to be involved? Um, they're gonna, are they going to install it? Then what kind of training are they going to train one person and then that person's going to train everyone else? Or are they going to train everybody in your organization? All these things have to be decided up front so that you don't have this problem later on. Critical ingredients, clear, concise language. Um, being concise is important. Consistency, you can't call it one thing here and something else here because then it creates kind of a question, well, are you talking about the same thing? Um, easy to read and understand. Um, don't use an eight-point font. Um, I mean, I know that, that suppliers try to do that with their contracts <coughs> that you can't read, but use a, 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 a font that can be read. Don't try to get fancy with colors um, because there's a lot of colors that just some people have difficulty reading, and if you want them to actually pay attention to what is the words say, you don't you can't have them worrying about the format that it's in. Um, make them easy to revise. Um, you know, you need to be able to go in there and change things if you need to. Um, if you take, if you have doc a document that has a bunch of PDFs in it, then you have to change the entire PDF. It's, it just, <coughs> it, it's intermingling with different types of forms. It makes it difficult for you to change. You need to be, up, be able to update quickly. Because the idea is, if you get a question, if you find that there's something in it that's wrong, you need to be able to go in and make a quick change so that you can and notify people of that change. A standard format, good organization, like I said earlier, make it so that they can know where it's going to be each time. Um, common among agencies, departments, and divisions. Try not to have a situation where each of your different divisions or departments has a doc, have, are using documents that look totally different. Try to standardize as much as possible. Um, it'll help you, it'll help the vendors, and it'll help your end users. Categorized um, and, and having a numbering system. <coughs> I saw some specifications recently where it was four pages of typed stuff, no breaks between paragraphs, no numbers, no, I mean, nothing. <laughs> and I, I told them, I said, look, people, we've got to make this so you can read it. Go back in, you know, put in a numbering system. So that if, if, if somebody has a question, they can call me and say, Don, section 3A causes me a problem. And I can go to 3A and look at it. But if they're calling me and saying, Don, um, about halfway down on the third page, you know, it, it just, it's not good business. And you wouldn't like reading something looking like that, so don't put something like that out. Categorize it. You know, this is the section on terms and conditions. One, two, three, four, four A, B, and C. Um, this is the section on um, requirements. These are the delivery requirements. Um, this is how to submit the bid. One, two, three, four. This is how we're going to evaluate the bid. One, two, three, four. So that everyone can look at it real quickly and figure out what sections they need to look at. Helps them, helps you. Other considerations, um, life cycle costing. Um, huge, uh, you know, like I said, 30 years ago, we weren't using it as much. Now, I urge people to find ways that they can incorporate life cycle costing. Um, looking at the total, the purchase price, but what are the maintenance costs, the supply costs, disposal value? What is the, the value to your organization over the life of the product or service, as opposed to just what the purchase price is? It allows you to buy better quality products, better quality services. Your end users are happier. Your suppliers, the good ones, are happier. 
and you're giving your citizens um, more value for the money, so um, it, it's beneficial. So I urge people to take that. How many of you are using any kind of life cycle costing? What you do? We uh, uh, automobiles was the basic one that we started with because we found that uh, uh, about half the cost of the vehicle was after we bought it. So, you know, were we making the truly the, the lowest uh, responsible bid uh, the award? And found that when you start adding in the maintenance costs, which vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, uh, and the, the cost of supplies, the mileage, et cetera, it really did have an effect on what the total cost of ownership ended up being. And we started into uh, Heating and cooling units, mm -hmm. uh, uh, air conditioners, etc. Yeah. yeah, automobiles. I tried that. Getting getting an agreement in the in the industry on maintenance costs <coughs> has been very difficult for me. Yeah. Were you successful with that, or did you just tell them what the kind? <laughs> well, we uh, we went back to uh, their posted prices. They they had to provide copies of their posted prices, and uh, we used that. Uh, getting Public Works to go along with it, uh, because the preferred vendor didn't always then end up getting the, the award. But we did get them to track for like three years, and the cost did compare very uh, closely with what they uh, showed in the original award. Interesting. Good. Anybody else using total cost of ownership life cycle? I urge you to consider. Look at the <coughs> stuff you're buying and determine are we buying it the best way or could we take maintenance, um, supplies, other things into consideration in the evaluation and award process and would it change things? Would we be getting a better product that might last longer, um, give our people a better um, end result. Um, price volatility, you know, again, I mentioned that earlier. If something has a huge, pr prices go up and down a lot, the length of your contract can't be very long. Um, <coughs> supply volatility, you know, just, it may impact the size of your order. If, if something, you know, if you're worried about running out of something, you're going to submit a, a, have a larger order and keep more in stock. What's the cost? to you to keep it in stock? What's the spoilage? All those types of things are things you've got to be thinking about to determine what is the best amount to order and how often. Um, like I said, numbering, numbering your paragraphs to 2.1, 2.11, etc. Some, com some kind of numbering system. Title the documents in the paragraphs so that people can easily find you know, what, what they're looking for, term of the contract, things like that. The consistent organization, I already mentioned that. Um, expository style, different styles of writing. Um, it's not imaginative, it's not creative, there's no criticism, no argument, no opinions. Um, there's, you know, it's the intent, it conveys information, it's explanatory. It, it, it's quite honestly, it's um, uh, boring, very boring, <laughs> but it's uh, good. If you're writing, if you're writing short stories, Forget about it. You know, get creative. You know, bring some um, fiction into it. But if you're writing mm -hmm. specifications, keep it s short and sweet and simple, um, because you're not trying to entertain the people with your writing ability. You're just trying to make sure they all understand what you're trying to get. Um, again, identify your audience. Who it is that's submitting these bids? Are these people that are um, highly technical and understand the business world mm -hmm. very well? Or these people that um, you know sell, feed, and seed from a store on the corner, um, because how you approach them is going to be different. Um, their traits, their attitudes, their educational background, um, their language level, um, their politics, uh, what authority they have, what, what the literacy level is, um, special technical training. The bottom is who, it, who is it that you're submitting, your, putting your bid out to? And take that into consideration when you're writing and when you're um, developing a specification. 
Like I said earlier, if you're changing the way business is done, invite them in, talk to them. Let them know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Help them understand the process and the document. No, you can't help them write their bid, but you can help them understand what it is you're looking for. And if you're not, if they're having trouble with that, maybe there's some ways that you can help them. There may be some situations where they shouldn't be competing. They aren't ready for it. And that's understandable. But it helps if you have a clear understanding. Words mean something. Shall, will, require. Those are mandatory. It has to be in there. Should, may, desire. Those are not mandatory. Make sure that your words mean what you want. If you say they shall um, sign in blue ink, Guess what? They have to sign in blue ink. Realistically, you should throw their bid out if they don't, if you, because if you said shell. Um, but if you say, well, it, it, sh it should be um, at least seven horsepower, well, should doesn't mean it has to be. So you've got to make sure you, you understand what the words mean and use them properly. Keeping it simple, you know, you could use conglomeration, or you could just say mixture, uh, incinerate or burn is recommended that or just we, we recommend on consideration of the fact that how about because a lot of this is like if you're a lawyer and you're getting paid by the page you want to stretch it out and say in consideration of the fact that the four you know you go through a whole paragraph to say one person is black and one person is white that doesn't make any sense just use simple words quick and easy Closing thoughts. It's unwise to pay too much, but it's worse to pay too little. When you pay too much, you lose a little money. That is all. But when you pay too little, you sometimes lose everything because the thing you bought was incapable of doing the thing it was bought to do. <coughs> like I said, when you're buying um, tables for an eighth grade cafeteria and you buy the cheapest table and you have to replace it every three weeks, you're not saving any money. You're not saving anybody any time. But if you write specifications for a product that will stand up to what you're going to be using it for, it'll last, it costs more up front, but it lasts longer, and your total overall cost for classroom t or cafeteria tables will be lower over the long run. So you've got to be careful about what you write. Don't, don't write specifications. Don't bid things to get the cheapest product. Because it never is very seldom is in your best interest. You cannot enforce the specification you intended to write, the one you thought you write, or the one you wished you did. You can only enforce the specification you used. In other words, you know, hindsight's 2020. You know, it's, I can always say, well, I should have done that. But once you write that specification, you're going to get what you, what you asked for. And if you didn't ask for the right thing, you're going to cause yourself problems. Questions, comments, thoughts? I really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you today. And I, as president of NIGP, I'm, I'm just really excited that we've got people all over the country, all over the world, actually, that are involved in public procurement, looking for ways to, to make the world better. And if there's anything that I or NIGP can do for you, your chapter, your entity, let us know. We're all in this together. Yes, ma'am. I have a couple of things. First of all, do you, or does NIGP, do you have standards for cycle times on different types of solicitation? The question is standards for cycle times. Um, no, and probably the reason is because it's such a, a ver there's so many variables. Um, you know, you know cycle time from the time it's first determined that you didn't have a need, or cycle time from the time you're first notified of that need, um, and depending on what's the cost, what's the commodity, what's the service, it, it can vary. Now, there's lots of people that are trying to come up with benchmarking, and there are some um, studies that are done on benchmarking. Um, if you'll shoot me an email, I will check to see what the latest ones are, if, if there's anything that could be utilized. Um, Good question. It almost, to me. Uh, no, a lot well, of it, well, it takes the complexity of the project, too. Yeah. 
I mean, we're we're all being asked for those kind of things. We're all being said it's taking too long. So early, great great answer to be able to say, well, within these benchmarks. But the vari the variables are just so many that um, I guess rather than cycle time, I'd rather see benchmarking on customer satisfaction. You know, there's a lot of people that are doing customer satisfaction surveys, just you know, short four or five questions. If you do them consistently enough and, uh, and um, broad enough, then you sh should start seeing you know where your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, that communication with the end users. Um, one thing's that you know, and everybody's structured a little bit differently, mm -hmm. but a lot of entities have their buyers focusing on um, a certain commodity area or service area. Like this person handles all our IT. This one does all of our MRO type thing. Um, some people have found it more beneficial continue to have that expertise in the office, but creating a one-to-one -one relationship between the end user and the procurement office, where you take that buyer and he goes out to the parks department and spends three, five, six hours with them, looking around, seeing what's going on. Then when they have a question, whether it's on IT or lawn mowers or fertilizer, the first he's their first resource. And that creates a situation where you've got better communication and quite honestly cuts down on some of the cycle times because the problem most of us have with, with cycle times is we get something and it's incomplete, mm -hmm. we don't have the information we need, and when we ask for it, they don't respond quite as quickly as we'd like them to, and then we get blamed for delaying them. I've got one guy on campus that's just great. He'll, he'll come to me with this, it's usually in one in a staff in a meeting of some type, and he'll hit me with this idea that he's got, he will, I really want you to do this, we need to do it fairly fast. I said, okay, well, great. Shoot me an email, kind of give me an outline, outline of what you're looking for. I, I go back and start doing some research on what it is he's looking for. I don't hear from him again for six months, you know. But when I do hear from him, it's like, we need it tomorrow. But as far as cycle time, Shoot me an email and I'll, I'll see what I can find. Okay. Thank you. You, have you. You always have those ones where they bring you in, the packet's all ready, the scope's good, the, the, the plans are good, and all, and then you start going through and then you have issues with it. That's uh, one of the things we try to do is we have kind of a central depository now for our bids, RFPs, and our scope of work. Our templates are set, we have our, our set terms and conditions. So what we concentrate in on, so what we do is we have a, a list, a checklist that our department's fill out that has all the stuff in it, budget code to pay for advertising, all the other stuff we need to do, who the project manager is, what is contact information, is there a, is there a uh, engineer involved, is it, is it an in-house engineer, is it a pay consultant, they give us that information sheet. Then what, what I do is I collect all the information, you send me the specs, I look them over, if we see anything out of it. Some of the stuff he's talked about today, we have a check sheet uh, one for bids, one for RFPs. It basically goes through some of the, uh, some stuff that Don's already talked about where it says you should number your paragraphs. We don't allow to put anything in the footer. That's our area, stay out of it. You can have all the header you want, the numbers, page numbers, whatever. We want the footer. So we put our page numbers and all down there. So we have a checklist list that tells them what everything they need. Once they put all that together and we have it all in one place, then I take it to the buyer and go, here you go. Makes the, makes the, because I tell them, I can't tell you how long it's going to take till you fill, the, fill all those blocks and tell me exactly where we're at. Um, you know, and then it depends on the complexity of the project a lot of times. If you have, like we would rather put out a construction, a large construction project that has blueprints with it, multiple blueprints with it, we'd rather put it out for 45 days. Yeah. Because we know that every construction company I think seems to do this. They'll look at those and they'll sit them on their desk for the first 30 days, mm -hmm. and then the last 15, they'll go, oh my gosh, we gotta get that fit out, you know, so. Interesting you say that. Um, I was meeting, the, the, the NIGP has a, a business council, NIGP yeah. business yeah. council, which is made up of some corporation, different corporations, and I was meeting with them about, you know, why they don't bid. In fact, they did a white paper, you can get it on the NIGP um, mm -hmm. website, it says, we, I know bid, I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that they, you know, I, I thought all along, we put out an invitation to bid, it goes and sits on somebody's desk 
you know, and then like you say, a week before <coughs> they start looking at it. What they were telling us, we, they get it, and immediately it goes to six or seven different places in the organization. Marketing, legal, cons you know, manufacturing, whatever. And they've got, they've, they've got to get input from all those before they can start working on, you know, so. But yeah, it's good points on these. Do y'all need copies of templates? <laughs> I'm just saying. You well, know. We, we refined a lot of our stuff in the fact that we used to do the same thing. We kind of get little bits and pieces from the project managers or the engineers at a time and all. And then the buyer would get it and we go, okay, so we got a buyer sitting on a, on a solicitation for six months when they got other things to do and then they're trying to follow up. So what we decided to do is I do that. I sit on those solicitations and I follow up and I say, look, well, when are we going to put that up? I don't have all your stuff. I can't give you a cycle time on this bid until you give me all the stuff. Once I have it, then I can tell you this is when we can cycle it through. Sometimes the monkey has to go back on the... We don't call them customers. We refer to them as clients because customers are always right and our clients are not always right. So, <laughs> citizens we refer to as customers because they're always right. You know, in our, so. Excellent. Okay, yes, sir. Um, where do you see the future of procurement with the onset of things like e-procure and bid sync and okay. where do I personally I see the future of public procurement um, very sim sim over the next 20 to 30 years very similar to that of the, the county world um, where in the 50s you could be an accountant and you didn't have to get a CPA you didn't, some people didn't even have a college degree Public procurement, I, I see, you're going to have to have a college degree to do it. You're going to have to be certified to do it. Um, maybe entry level, you can get in and start doing it. Um, but to move up where you can have any authority, I, I, I feel like there's going to be a threshold where if you're not certified and have a college degree, you're not going to um, be able to do it. As far as the e-procurement and things like that, what I see happening now is more of the... Um, the day-to-day -day, um, day -to -day stuff, the, the task stuff, is being moved to electronic, which gives the public procurement officer the ability not to be worrying about buying pens and pencils, but to be looking at the big projects um, and you know, really being at the table as you start talking about building the new intersection or um, you know, building the new building, or um, creating, not, not just buying the pavement that goes into the park, or the grass that goes into the park, but in the part of, being part of the whole entire design so that um, you're taking life cycle costs into consideration, you're looking at products that will last longer, things like that. Procurement officers will, will not be in a room at the end of the hall they'll be at the table helping to make those decisions because of the value that electronics, being able to process stuff electronically gives us more time to, um, in theory, you know, there's still a lot of day-to-day -day stuff. Yes, ma'am. Hey, um, I work in the construction um, part, and, you know, we're talking about specifications. Where we get in trouble is the qualifications. How the engineer or the PM writes the qualifications, and they're very exact. They have to have put in a dry pump pit station or, you know, whatever. Um, it gets us in trouble because they're, they're so exact. Um, I came from Colorado and we used to have similar scope and size and complexity. So we didn't pigeonhole ourselves in because we've had to throw out tons of bits. I mean, literally, it's so much money, it's mind-blowing. Okay, what process do you go through to hire your um, professional? architect engineer um, there's like there's a library but it, it's really not in procurement it's not us that would well do that. <laughs> again, my, my, what we've done um, I'm on my office someone my, my officer myself is on the panel with selecting um, the professional we do a request for qualifications get people that want to participate we look through the qualifications, look at their experience on similar size and scope of work. Usually we narrow it down to three. We have them come in and talk to us about what they're doing. And usually during that conversation, I ask them about their background with um, public 
um, projects and their understanding of things like buying furniture and equipment off state contract, um, op openness of specifications, and understanding that um, if the specifications are highly restrictive, they've got to be able to provide us good justification as to why the specifications are may appear to be overly restrictive, especially if only one or two vendors can bid on it. Right. But it, that communication with the professional, making sure they understand what your expectations are, has sometimes proven successful. Some we, we still run, we run into the same thing. Okay. But, um, anybody else have that, that issue? Yeah. I, I, could, could, could we add? Yeah. Are you talking about your internal engineers having helping you set those specifications? You're having trouble. Well, we don't write the specifications. We get it from the end user. Okay, so we're we're not in the business of doing that. But we have qualifications. Right, and I'm talking about the qualifications. The minimum qualifications. It must be. But you're getting those from internal folks, right? Not external. No, well, no. The engineers usually it's the external folks that are right. writing these long, drawn out, very exact qualifications and it, it for the contract. Us. We get a lot. We have a library. It's really the contract. The, uh, the end. Uh, the business unit puts a work assignment in to get uh, a professional, an engineer from the library, to start working on that specific project in development with. The, the business, you know, like in this case, public I, work. I understand. I used to do this yeah. for you. And, yeah. And we'd go back and forth with your group, and those qualifications would be honed by your internal group with that internal, professional you, before you saw about them. Public You're talking about public works. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. All yes. Place. They, and they so do that. That's what I'm saying. The professional, the, the, the private yes. engineer, would work with the public works folks right. before you'd see them. Yes. Okay, so it's internal folks. That are actually honing that qualification down before you see it. Yes, yes. they, it, so they it's do not pass so much it the private around. engineer. Well, the private engineer is probably going based on what the internal right. people are the telling. The internal right. folks are right. telling him what to say to you, right. and I mean, you're uh, getting something that's honed by that right. that group of folks internal. Right, they get it from the engineer, and then well, they the but our people. What's, what's been happening down. lately is unfortunately. That's right. But well, not it's getting very restrictive well, what you do back and forth between your internal folks and that right. engineer. What we do is we make them justify their, their qualifications. If you say they have to have 10 years experience, justify that to me. Why do they have to have 10 years experience? Is that an industry standard? Does a person doing lift station maintenance have to have five years experience replacing a pump? If they do, is that industry standard? Does everybody in the industry have a rough five years? Obviously, you have startup companies, you have new companies and all. What is the industry standard for experience to do a quality job? It blows their mind because then they got to go back and do some research and they're like, that's oh, great, we're going to take it out. Well, in one <laughs> the private engineer would be more than happy to go with whatever qualification yeah, exactly. that the government wanted. That's right. Yeah, it's the government that's specifying what that is. No, the private no, engineer is just, just going along with it. Yeah. Well, they probably specified it because they've had problems. It is the truth. Well, truth. So, in this one particular yeah. case that she was talking the about, the, the, in particular, the particular pump that yeah. they, they spec'd so, hasn't been put in the ground for like 50 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So oh, that's, that was the <laughs> issue it didn't bring up. didn't come up to the pre-bid meeting. Everyone had signed off on it. And then the actual consultant, the actual engineer, just basically said, oh, yeah, we don't really, uh, no one has done that. So in this case, it was a failure on the engineer, the professional service engineer, and the in-house representative. Because like I said, if you've worked with us before, then you know everyone in that group signs off on that, mm -hmm. and nobody caught it. Well, ma many times, um, we're told what you want. Yeah. Many times. Uh, and, 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 you know, and that's just get back to communication right. Right. between yeah, the, the, we're not on the procurement office right. needs to make sure the end user the understands right. the requirement for openness and competition. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that um, what I've done on, on like stuff like that is I, rather than five years of experience give me um, three projects where you've um, installed similar equipment in a similar situation yes. over the past five years that way yeah they may have, because you can have somebody that has 20 years of experience and not do he might be lousy <laughs> but um, if, if they can prove that they've done this before that we're not their bleeding edge on experiment then we're okay usually anything else yeah we came up with a checklist for our engineers that basically that makes them list where everything is in their specifications. Where did you put the liquidated damages at? Uh, did you lay it out like we asked you to? And some other questions we ask in there, how long is it going to take to complete this project, including lead times? 
because you, you get you get engineers who give you specifications. Oh, it would take 180 days to do this job at this lift stage. Oh, but we forgot to tell you there's a 120 day lead time on ordering the pumps. Right. Well, okay, and the bid's already been awarded. Right. So now you got to do an amendment to the contract to put another 120 days. We ask all that in our checklist. And when we get it, we go, okay, you're sure there's no lead time on pumps? Yes, we're sure they're in the market and everything and all. Okay. We've solved a lot of problems that That's way. That's a great idea. Because they'll come back and go, hey, we noticed in your check, uh, checklist you asked for lead times. Yeah, you're right, based on the industry standard, because this is what you paid the paid consultant for to find these things out. Mm -hmm. They'll come back and tell you, well, you didn't pay it. Yeah, we did. We're paying you $250 an hour to go out and find out what the lead time is on those pumps and what's the lead time on this uh, tubing oh, or this. You? So, you know, do what? $250 an hour, I want to work for you. No. <laughs> well, I'm using that as an example. We actually only pay them about 150 bucks an hour, for, that's for the principal, so. But uh, the, uh, uh, with that checklist, and, and checklist, you start out with a simple outline. What is it I want to know from these people? And then you refine it and go, okay, under this, I want to know this, this, and this under this and you end up with a one page and then you reduce it down and say okay I don't really need to know that I can find that out later and then you reduce it down to a one maybe a two page checklist if you need it but you start off with a basic outline of what you want to know in those specifications and what you do is you make them justify it in that outline say okay if it's a 180 day project is there any lead time on pumps and what you do is you do that on the experience based on the problems you've had with the paid consultant you go back and you address start to address I started out with a, a yellow legal pad, right down on, oh, 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 this guy screwed this up. Well, okay, all right, well, I don't like that, you know, and, and some of it I was able to solve, and some of it was I had to compromise on, and some of it, but Don made a good point. The biggest thing is communications. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is probably the biggest downfall yeah. between procurement and, and the clients that they work with or the customers they work with. That, that is usually the biggest problem I find. Well, the, I told you this, and I'm like, eh, so I usually haven't put it in writing. Send me an email. Don't tell me on the phone. Send me an email. I mean, you tell your you tell your contractors that. Don't tell me on the phone. If you want an addendum done on that, you send me an email, or you put it in writing in a letter. So it's I do the same thing with my clients I work with. I tell them, if that's what you want in the spec. You put it in an email. So Fantastic. plausible deniability. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I'm keeping you from lunch. So anything else? Well, if we not, want to make sure you get to the airport on time. Yeah. All the time. I, I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much for um, being here.